Hello, everybody, and welcome to Culturama. We have our special guest here, Mark. Is that your last name? Seibold. Mark Seibold. And he's going to give us a little introduction to art, art and astronomy. Mark, welcome aboard. Thanks, Lee. It's good to be here. Yeah. Where, did you come, where were you born? Where did you come from? Portland? Uh, Portland, Oregon. Actually, I tell people that yeah, I was born in the Pearl yeah. Art District. Okay. Good Samaritan now, there. how did you get involved in art initially? What was your impetus? Uh, we, cut uh, we grew up with a father who was an art major at the Portland Art Museum Art School. Our mm -hmm. mother was a model at Janssen Clothing, so we oh, had wow. a very flamboyant parents as far as <laughs> art and uh, fashion and uh, our father sketched a lot and painted in the house so we, mm -hmm. all three of his kids I was the eldest and probably picked this up first and started positive influences yeah. terrific okay so, and what brought you into the world of astronomy that's probably a little later in the <laughs> the game. game yeah it's probably my parents told me I was less than two years old I walked outside one night and pointed up and exclaimed I said moon as I pointed to the mm -hmm. moon so I'm sure I must have heard them say it. Beyond twinkle, twinkle, little star. Yeah, I wasn't really able to uh, see the stars as a kid. I was nearly blind when I, up until about age nine when they got me glasses. Wow. I was severely nearsighted, so I couldn't see the stars. I just mm -hmm. saw fuzzy, bright I think spots. Most of the Congress is nearsighted, I hear. Most of the Congress, po yeah. Politi that's, politically so. <laughs> that's understandable. I won't uh, probably didn't make any political comments at this okay, point. Okay, no. We don't want to be harassed. <laughs> Okay, so tell us a little bit, of, you're introducing us to the different art forms. You want to start with this one here, how this came about? Oh, this the audience is learning some new stuff. Sure, as far as uh, photography goes, uh, which is becoming very popular today, everybody has digital cameras now, mm -hmm. and it's increased tremendously. This is probably the most recent, uh, uh, I'm going to push this back here just so it doesn't go for it. But uh, this was at the Eclipse uh, spot up in Central Oregon at uh, the Painted Hills uh, mm. Desert last August. Uh, Oregon Parks had me go up and lecture for a couple of nights there in, a, mm -hmm. in an uh, amphitheater in a big state park and then I drove another hour east to the Painted Hills and this is actually, it goes through a little bit of a progression. That's at the full yeah. totality. You could actually see the flames from the face right. of the sun coming forth. Yeah, these are large uh, edge promises as they're called and they're probably equally as beautiful even at this point which is called the diamond ring effect. Mm. Um, right before totality, maybe t oh, it's probably 30 seconds. <clears throat> excuse me, before totality, mm -hmm. and you can see the edges of the sun. They're kind of w red, fiery-looking, flame-like structures. Mm -hmm. That's unfiltered, as a lot of people ask me, mm -hmm. and that's very stop-down aperture on the camera it would have just whited out. And uh, and then, of course, when the, the sun is completely covered by the moon's disk uh, for a little over two minutes, I think it was this time in Oregon. Um, you see the corona, and this has been, of course, processed later through mm -hmm. uh, Photoshop enhancement to bring the corona out with, with yeah. just minimal processing. But what it looked like over the entire area up there that day was a, uh, there's actually a wide angle shot here if I can do this. You can put them uh, down. Yeah, you can just set these down here. And that's th what the view looked like in a kind of a wide angle of where we were at. Mm -hmm. um, there's about a thousand people on this road that day, so this, this wow. the picture of us standing here is maybe Oh, maybe 50 or 100 people That's into the distance. That's central Oregon. But this belies the amount of people that were really here. Yeah. They were from all over the world. Uh, talked to people from China, Germany, um, Italians had come walking yeah, down. Yeah. So they traveled all the way from Italy. This is what it looked like at the back of the telescope uh, with the camera, which I didn't finish setting up here with the other telephoto lens on top and the camera attached to the back. Yes. Um, to see those larger pictures first. And then this one was taken with a 200 millimeter telephoto. And you can see Venus uh, in the sky here. I don't know if the cameras will pick that up. But a little God. speck of like starlight, uh, the third oh. brightest object in the sky after oh. the sun and the moon. So it was a spectacular day to be there. It was near 100 degrees. My my air conditioning had gone out in my Mercedes, so I, I had a grueling trip riding home man, for four man. hours. But it was great to be there. So the heat was on. <laughs> yes, it was. And uh, we had to wait the night out on the road. They had people in their cars waiting for six hours before they let us drive in. Mm. And you could not drive up on the Painted Hills Road. They had a big parking lot below. Well, I mean, they need to, to corral people in that, because especially out-of-towners mm -hmm. might wander to places they don't belong. Oh, yeah. They were concerned about the ecology of the area and too many cars driving onto the roads and mm -hmm. maybe damaging them. So Makes they, sense. They restricted all the auto traffic for that day only. Mm -hmm. But... Uh, so those are Painted Hills. Yeah, and... Uh, How far is that from, from Salem? Uh, straight, a straight, hours, a straight drive, probably about two hours. Yeah, it was a little over two hours, 
to the Prineville Reservoir State Park where I stayed a few nights. The mm -hmm. state park had me. Uh, yeah, I know Bend there. and I know Sun River. Mm -hmm. It's beyond that? Uh, beyond what? Bend. Yeah, Bend is, well, from Salem here is probably just a good hour and a half, I guess. So the Painted Hills are probably another hour. Oh, um, I know La Grande. Yeah, La Grande's way into eastern Oregon, of course. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, that's another th several hours away yet. Mm -hmm. but, um, so there were people that went that far. The shadow path, of course, extended across the nation. Mm -hmm. And uh, many people went to Lincoln City, Oregon. They were worried about the morning fog, which did accumulate there, and uh, mm -hmm. blocked some views. So people hurriedly moved away from the coastline and got up to the hills mm -hmm. to see the eclipse. Mm -hmm. And in the foothills of the coast yeah. range there. What does this represent, the orange thing? Well, that's it's, the way this... That's, it's not Tropicana. <laughs> no, that's the way the sun looks through an H-alpha. Uh, that's an old print, an H-alpha filtered telescope that I took mm -hmm. across the nation and let mm -hmm. uh, thousands of people look at the sun through it. It was uh, a special solar filtered telescope, mm -hmm. again, with an H-alpha filter. Hydrogen alpha light is what we're actually looking at mm -hmm. the sun in, essentially in the red end of the spectrum near infrared. Yeah. And uh, I borrowed the Rose City Astronomer's Telescope uh, by arrangement with them to do this for 10,000 miles across yeah. the country. Now that's the telescope. That's, a, that's the exact same design. This is my own that was given to me later mm -hmm. to teach some astronomy over in the Fiji Islands. This is a smaller five-inch uh, mirror uh -huh. uh, cast grain design. That's an eight-inch. Uh, do any of the colleges in here have a department of astronomy? Or? Oh, quite a few, yeah. There's all over the state. Um, one of the, Does Willamette have one? As far as I know, they do. I know the famous astronomer Jay Pasikoff came here. Uh, he was an astronomy see. writer for many years into mm -hmm. his 70s now, and he I think conferred with the people from the uh, Willamette University. Mm -hmm. They must have a, I, I don't know every college okay. and every, every there course. There was some talk about at some point having a meteorological institute that would be possibly linked up with Western Oregon University or mm -hmm. an associate's degree maybe at Chemeketa, uh, something in the future. The Western University out in uh, Monmouth that's is, is a big, uh, that's where John Dobson appeared every year to provide his telescope building mm -hmm. classes. Uh, for many years, and uh, he was the famous sidewalk astronomer that uh, passed away at age 98 a few years ago. I worked with him a little bit in, in providing some education in the local Portland area. He stayed at a big astronomy store up in Battleground, Washington mm -hmm. for two summers. Our uh, coffee Tell pot Tell us here. what this is all about. Uh, yeah, I was making vacuum pot coffee here. I know that I told many friends I was going to do this, and uh, mm -hmm. I have to find my shoulder bag. It's got the bag of coffee in here. You're trying we... to duplicate uh, Mount St. Helens here. Right? No, no. No, but it'll, I'll put the lid back on. But it's, uh, it's uh, if it boils a little too much, it can, so the coffee has to go into the top here once the water reaches okay, boiling. This is a noble scientific experiment. Oh, I just brushed a little bit there, sorry. And uh, these were invented in the mid-1800s by a German. Uh, later in the history books, it stated that it was uh, a Scot Scottish man, uh, Sir Robert Napier of, um, Somewhere in Scotland, he made these in the shipyards out of metal instead of glass. It's starting to percolate over. Yeah, it, won't, it shouldn't go over. Um, I'm going to stir it a bit here if I can find it. I meant to bring in a silverware with me, but I have a fork here in my bag. I hope it doesn't go over. That cup run us over a little. It shouldn't. Yeah, it, won't, it shouldn't boil over. It just steeps for two minutes like this. Uh, the water infuses with the coffee grounds in the top bowl. Mm -hmm. uh, it's all been forced up by through the siphon tube, as they call it. Now, is this also related to astronomy in some way? Uh, it, could, it could become uh, cosmic coffee, maybe, if I, oh. if I title it so. But, um, Cafe Cosmos. Yeah, these were, I discovered these, uh, my first wife and I had wandered into a Starbucks up in Northwest Portland one morning, mm -hmm. and they were demonstrating one. Mm -hmm. and it was a brand new one like this. And yeah. then I discovered antiques shortly after and started collecting them. But. Uh, these were used in all the coffee houses across America mm -hmm. uh, in the early 20th century until uh, Madame, I can't think of her name, or the German lady that invented the paper cone filter, mm. um, Melita, invented that paper filter cone. And that displaced all these from the coffee houses. Oop. And uh, yeah, we're just going to. We'll cover it. We'll cover right it. Right. Sorry about that, Lee. We'll just. <laughs> that can turn. Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pull it off the bottom here real quick. Mm. Sorry about that. It's called the coffee baptism. Yeah, it's. I, did, I do, don't usually try to plan for that if, unless I'm in a kitchen somewhere. Things. Yeah. Makes so life after, go easier. Yeah, after about two minutes, uh, it's removed from the heat and it'll settle down. Mm -hmm. And as soon as it cools rapidly in the bottom, 
we're going to unplug this too. As soon as it begins to cool, it creates vacuum pressure in the lower bowl. And you'll see it uh, draw the coffee back down. It'll become a hot number. Oh, yeah. It's just, it's the most exquisite way to brew coffee. Peop Many people say that the French press is the most exquisite way to get the best cup of coffee, but the vacuum pot is every bit as good as the French press and even better because the French press allows it coffee to get to that screen. It leaves a silt or a mud in the bottom of the cup. This doesn't allow anything to come through. That's a glass rod that filters mm -hmm. the, um, the point to hold the grounds to mm -hmm. the top. So it should be done here. Now, let's, let's tell us a little story about how you started out doing this photography that intermingles the world of astronomy. Well, the photography, yeah. yeah, the photography yeah. is... Uh, Once upon a time. I started uh, <laughs> probably about age two or three on my second or third birthday. Um, my parents handed me this exact Kodak camera, Kodak mm -hmm. box camera. So mm -hmm. the box that came in from, I think, from Myron Frank Department Store downtown in about 1955. Way back. Yeah, and it's... Uh, I thought this was all there was to a camera. I wish I had the film. I had a roll I was going to bring and I forgot. Mm -hmm. But my father used to let me load the film and pull it across onto the spindle and turn it. Mm -hmm. And then once you got it attached, you put this back on and you looked mm -hmm. in a little dark orange window here to to uh, turn it up to to numeral one for the first exposure. Yeah. So um, you have to look down through a right angle finder. Mm -hmm. So I probably went around the house a lot as a child just looking through this finder with no film in it and just pretending like I was taking pictures. Look, Mommy, smile. So, Say cheese. Yeah, and I, I've, got, I've, got, I've got all these today. Um, mm -hmm. All these Kodak uh, prints I still have. I've displayed them on my, uh, on my Facebook site and other mm -hmm. places online. It wasn't until much later, um, just after graduation from high school, I decided to buy a, a real camera. And that's what took uh, some of my first... I think some of the photos are out here on the front, but they're mm -hmm. covered up. There's some here of comets across the front. It's about seven or eight. Well, that comets. long, yeah, that long yeah. piece stretched all the way across comet, the front of the comet. floor. But I'm looking left to right here uh, in the monitor and seeing uh, a comet hail bop is sitting sideways over Mount Hood there in the blue mm -hmm. image in the center. And oh, then, yes, I see. And then to its, um, this way, as you have to point out, to its uh, right, is it? It's to the left, is Comet Hyakutake, which has a very fine, uh, thin, wispy tail, but the tail of Hyakutake extended farther across the sky than Hale Bob did. Mm -hmm. um, those are both on film. I think there's one more in there on film. Uh, over to your side, it looks like a little green, kind of ghostly snowball. That's Comet Holmes. It could be seen in daylight, in the mm -hmm. evening twilight. I took that through my Dobsonian mm -hmm. telescope, which I did not bring here today. It's, it's pretty Why don't big. we take a minute and explain to people what comets are and how they're formed? Well, as most of the books will state, they're uh, they're, in essence, uh, simply described as dirty snowballs, frozen snowballs, and... Uh, but they're not made of snow. No, they're made up of their construction of their material and the, is almost rocky, like the moon, but mm -hmm. there's other things going on. There's gases inside that heat up as they approach the sun, and they travel long elliptical orbits. Uh, some of them go out for thousands of years and then come back, and mm. uh, the famous Halley's Comet uh, has a revolution period of only 76 years. Mm. Uh, the famous timing of that one is that it, uh, it, when it came in, I think uh, Mark Twain was born, and then the year he died, the comet had returned again. Mm -hmm. So he lived during the Full whole... circle, literally. Yeah. By the way, for those who don't know what ellipsis is, means oval shape. That's right. Yeah. We've we got to make sure that we, we're addressing a lay audience and not everybody. Right. And it's not just the, plan, or not just the comets that uh, run uh, elliptical orbits, the planets are also in ellipses too, and that, that mm -hmm. draws another big part of astronomical history that uh, a lot of the ancients, uh, what we call the modern astronomers around the time mm -hmm. of uh, Copernicus and Tycho Brahe, thought the planets were all on perfectly circular orbits, and they mm -hmm. couldn't figure out why. They didn't understand the uh, heliocentric universe yet. They thought mm -hmm. we were at the center. And so Mars did this little retrograde yeah. thing throughout the year. Of all the planets in the solar system, which one most fascinates you and why? Well, that's... Uh, that's tough. I think I'm interested in all of them, really. Um, Mars is coming close again, uh, as, it as, had, it is. as it did in 2003. Mm -hmm. um, that's where we're supposed to have the next mission go to. And uh, fortunate that uh, someone like Elon Musk is, is building this new SpaceX program. Mm -hmm. He'll probably be the one to take us, in collaboration with NASA, from what they say. But mm -hmm. it is possible that you know, there could be microbial life there that we haven't seen yet, even though we got the rovers and the the um, 
the other Mars landers there and, and looking at the surface uh, and recognize uh, there's an orbiter I think that takes photos too but uh, there's no real conclusive evidence yet that there's been any life found there uh, in fact nowhere in the universe with all the SETI research we hear about the search for extraterrestrial life uh, we're hoping we're going to make some contact one day with somebody but Mm -hmm. As far as we know, there hasn't been, mm -hmm. been any contact made yet. Uh, the Voyager spacecrafts are out, way out of the mm -hmm. solar system now with those gold records mm -hmm. that Carl Sagan had put on there in case it reaches... I'm going to not take too much time, Sure. but I once attempted to write a science fiction story, and I'll give you just part of it. Nobody better steal it and publish it ahead <laughs> of me. But uh, it was, takes place on the planet of Venus where they had a thriving population of people that somewhat different than us, and they didn't believe that there was any sign of life on Earth. Then in 1945, we saw the big mushroom cloud when the atom bomb was dropped, and they said, maybe this, there is some, something on Earth that we have to look at because we never saw this kind of thing before. Mm -hmm. So they took about two years, and they had a mission. They sent me to save money of the Venusian Parliament to come there, and they went through asteroids and comets and stuff. And finally, my rocket ship, hovers above what is today Yellowstone National Park. And then some water spouts up, good old faithful, and it extinguishes the exhaust of the rocket ship and forces a crash landing right in the mouth of old faithful. And, um, and my Venusian skin gets evaporated and into a small molecule and swallowed up in the geyser and then it spouts out again. And the upshot is that my future mother and father are on their honeymoon in Yellowstone, and she's yawning because she had an active night before. Oh, what a coincidence. And, and as she swallows me, uh, I become reborn as an earthling hmm. nine months later. And that's the story of how I am recycled from Venus to Earth. Yeah, it's interesting. <laughs> that's, that's great. So you got this published? It's no, that was a, an idea I have for a story that's never been published. I've, I've been working on mm. one that's um, actually, reality, it's my trip I took across the nation mm -hmm. for 10,000 miles and everybody I stayed with or asked mm -hmm. me to, invited me to stay with them and mm -hmm. all the people I met. But uh, it's a true retelling, kind of a journal day by day. Mm -hmm. I've halfway published it. I put some excerpts up on Facebook and uh, uh, I, I should say if you want a cup of coffee, we should. And even us astronauts are going to need to have a little coffee to kind of stay awake for the show and be able to discuss all this with the audience. Okay? Okay. Benito, good. Here we are, this magical brew. Cheers. And if it works out not okay, we'll call it the boohoo brew. <laughs> I play with words sometimes. Okay. Anyway, to continue there, Mark, what's the uh, upshot of how the photography and the ast and the astronomy got merged? That took a little longer. You know, I looked in my childhood astronomy books, which I also brought with me here somewhere too, and I was gonna hold them up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'd seen pictures of the stars in these small books and wondered, of course, how they were taken. And uh, mm -hmm. it wasn't until I decided after I bought my first telescope with my berry picking money, they wrote about there in the Oregonian article mm -hmm. uh, after I took the clubs across the country. Yes, but, yes. So I didn't have the proper camera to attach to the telescope or through it. So I attached my parents. Mm -hmm. box camera by strapping it to the top of my first telescope, mm -hmm. which I still have. I was going to bring that today and I forgot it. But, And I guided with a star in the middle of the eyepiece uh, on Orion's belt and took about a five or ten minute exposure on high speed mm -hmm. uh, Tri-X black and white film. I've still got that negative somewhere today and I just mm -hmm. don't know where I'm going to uncover it. So that was my first attempt. But it wasn't until uh, a few years later, that was when I was 13 or 14 with this attached mm -hmm. to my telescope. I eventually bought this at the time of high school graduation and took art courses in photography at mm -hmm. Mountain Community College. And putting this onto a tripod, of course, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I started you, the photos. Do you have any advice here. for young people just thinking of getting involved in photography and I guess you call it stellar photography? Well, there's a lot of uh, different avenues to take. Uh, people ask me all the time when I'm out with the telescopes and letting the public look through them. Mm -hmm. um, as soon as people today see something, they, the first thing they think of is they want to photograph it. They ask me if they see it in the telescope, can we take a picture through the eyepiece? Mm -hmm. So they want to hold their iPhones up uh, over the eyepiece, and, and the it answer, works. The answer is? It works, but it doesn't do that well. It's very mm -hmm. diminished resolution. Mm -hmm. 
So the best start is usually to get what I'm using today for the photos you've seen here of the Eclipse uh, is, a, is a medium grade digital. And uh, Sony makes an amazing one. I feel like I'm doing an ad here for Sony. Mm -hmm. But this has no what's, advertising. Yeah, this is what's called an APS C sensor. It's about three quarters the size of a full frame, the really big cans and mm -hmm. Nikons. And Sony has a big one now called the A7. It's a full frame, mm -hmm. but um, with the lens. And uh, mm. of course, the lenses are interchangeable and they're easily programmable. What made these popular was their small size mm -hmm. and easy to operate. They, well, they seem to appeal a lot to yeah. women because they're easily held. Now, Mark, they, is there a particular held. season of the year where photographing stars is more prolific or, or better focusable? Well, the better weather helps, of course. Uh, Oregon's and Portland's uh, rainy season of the clouds is not the best to right. do photography. But we do have clear nights in the winter when you can see Orion and its you great nebula. That, and, yeah. and I have a a series I think I gave uh, Luis that shows that. Mm -hmm. uh, easily photographed the Orion Nebula um, without even tracking, just on a tripod. Um, Are there any big events coming up in the sky in the next year or two that we should focus on? Well, the current one would probably be Mars. Um, I'm trying to think in the near future. Another solar eclipse occurs in yeah, uh, 2024 uh, across starting in eastern New Mexico, across Texas, and up to the Midwest and eastern. Mm -hmm seaboard states. There's an eclipse next year in South America, a uh, total eclipse. Uh, what part? It will go through Chile and Argentina. I haven't looked at the path yet. Okay, so. So people will maybe, maybe so those travel start to that. Saving up now. Yeah, so a lot of people will travel to see eclipses. The furthest I've ever traveled is only to, uh, to photograph it in 1979 mm -hmm. here with my wife in the gorge, and then this one up mm -hmm. to the central Oregon area this time. Which brings an interesting question. Uh, Obviously, Chile and Argentina are in the southern hemisphere. We're in the northern hemisphere. Does it sort of alternate or, or not really? There's patterns. Um, there's a, what is the word? I think it's called Soros. It's the pattern of the sun uh, mm -hmm. uh, returning the eclipses uh, through certain parts of the, the world. Yeah. Um, and there's a pattern every few years. It's almost like a mathematical geometry, but it's not that precise. Uh, mm -hmm. It spans many several hundreds of years for the total cycle. As far as I remember, I may have the numbers wrong. I have to look that up again. But, for example, we didn't have a total eclipse here in, over the Portland area since 1979. This was the second time now in 38 years that this one occurred. Mm. Almost the same time of the morning, too. That one was at 9 in the morning. This one was at 10.20. Yeah. Um, and the, the period of uh, totality ranges by the distance of the moon from mm. us because the moon's size can be a little bit larger or smaller. Yeah. Yeah. Aperture now, parity. was the state prepared for the... That was, a big, that was a big concern. That was a concern about it was. traffic on I-5 and all those things. It stuff. was. I think there was an over-concern, and maybe it was a little over-publicized, something that didn't happen last time 38 years ago. But this time, I think with the Internet yes. conveying information much faster, I think people were getting a little too over-concerned with that we had no way of knowing how many people would visit Oregon. And mm -hmm. they thought there could be many You don't millions. need a passport from one state to the other. No. <laughs> so uh -huh. uh, it wasn't as, as crowded as they thought. I got up to the location I had to get up to in two hours, mm -hmm. but I was leaving three days early. So the people left at the last minute still even drove out of Portland and got down to the Salem area. They only had to go about 25 miles south. Mm -hmm. and, and many said, well, we thought that a 99.5% eclipse was good enough. They didn't get to see the corona um, because they didn't get in the path of totality. And many other subtle effects that happen in the totality mm -hmm. path. So uh, it was well planned. I think the state did a great job. Uh, there were no, nothing, no concerns of traffic, except the, the mass exodus after it ended that day. There was a big rush to get back home. Mm -hmm. So there were a lot of people that uh, were held up for maybe a few extra hours getting home. It took me four hours to get back, yeah. going further east out through Fossil to the gorge and back. Yes. So I drove an extra 150 mm -hmm. miles just to avoid the traffic over the, mm -hmm. over the mountain. Mm -hmm. Now, there's still a debate as to whether Pluto is a planet or something else. Oh, yeah. You have any thoughts on that? You know, that started a few years ago when they decided that it was, uh, it's on the outer fringes of our solar system as we know it. So it's in what's called the frozen right. region of planets. And um, the, the word planet comes from Greek planetes, which means wanderers. Mm -hmm. And so people could even be thought of as wanderers. But the ancients saw these objects wandering against the backdrop of the stars in the sky, mm -hmm. and they didn't understand what they were. Um, the difference with Pluto has now been changed drastically since the, the uh, New Horizons mission went out a couple of years ago and took close-up photos of it. We now see that it's got mountains and it's got an atmosphere. Yeah. It's almost like an early Earth in a way. Mm -hmm. So people think yeah. maybe it should be re-identified as a planet again. But it's now called a Plutoid. 
and the whole regions of those plants are identified as plutoids mm -hmm. in the outer frozen mm -hmm. region. I've always been fascinated by the, the moons that go around Saturn, what, there are uh, 10 or 12 of them? Uh, it's got more, it's got more like 30 or more. Mm -hmm. you, you could say it's got an innumerable amount because the rings themselves are broken rock material from possibly a broken moon that's broken mm -hmm. into millions of bits. Fragments. And uh, you can see the moons of Saturn. I was going to show a photo of the moons and uh, mm -hmm. our moon with the two planets. I could grab that real quick if I could stand up and maybe I don't want to. Well, you're, you're tethered with the microphone. Yeah, it's, so I left it here behind. I don't want to see you um, hung in effigy. Yeah, it's, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you can look through a small telescope and even see Jupiter's moons okay. easily, like Galileo did, the four yeah. bright ones. Jupiter's got probably 20, okay. 30 moons. If you were there. running the NA NASA, which you aren't, what would your next mission be? What would you consider well, your priority that's, mark? Uh, that's a real question to ponder. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the universe is so big, NASA is now doing most of their research with, uh, mm -hmm. with robotic space probes. Mm -hmm. And they've launched all these new space telescopes. The big one, the, uh, gosh, am I going to forget, the, the Magellan going up next year? Yes, yes. Yeah, it's huge. It's, it's like three, four times the size of the Hubble, or even larger than that. It's all going to unfold in space like a big magic carpet with this huge observatory floating on it, just open air, mm -hmm. unprotected. And it's going to do massive research uh, above what the Hubble. The Hubble's been a great instrument. Mm -hmm. They said if anything, anything, the Hubble will go down in history as mm -hmm. the greatest uh, artwork of the now universe. The Hubble is, is owned by the U.S., right? Right. It's had uh, so, European uh, people also contribute okay. to some of the, the work. The question I'm asking is, the machinery does, it, does it have any kind of strategic value in terms of the military protectiveness? You know, that's a defensive thing. I don't know that. I, that's, mm -hmm. I almost think that's like some of the conspiracy theories you hear on the web. But Well, I'm, not, it, I'm just wondering what if. A lot of people it ask. Would, it would seem that. Sure. Uh, I didn't think about that to this minute. Would you believe that uh, in 1962, I had the honor of being a United Nations intern at the press desk in the Secretariat? One of my early assignments was to research and write press releases about the new crop of weather satellites just being invented and how they were going to help uh, in third world countries to prevent or offset famines and that kind of thing and also fishery type things. So I, I was technically in the ground floor without knowing it. Interesting. So did, did you learn anything about the Hubble being used for more than just space research? Well, there was no Hubble at in 1962. Oh, that's right. It was planned already, you know, in the 50s. You know, it, this is just the weather satellites that would, the, the earliest breed that would go around the Earth and they would, you know, take weather patterns, I guess, of clouds and thunders and, and really become meteor, uh, tools for meteorology. You probably remember the first uh, thing we had put up was the, uh, well, the Russians had the Sputnik up first yeah. in 57. I was three years old and I saw mm -hmm. it. Just Vaguely that night in October, uh, after I saw my first comet and, in the sky. And our first thing blew up in the launch pad. Ours did? Yeah. yeah before they got the, uh, yeah. the, we had the Echo 1 and Echo 2 uh, mm -hmm. satellites that went up. You would yeah. probably remember that. It was a disappointment with during the Eisenhower yeah. years. It was in the 1950s. But you asked me, I don't know if I answered the question. Uh, yeah. I, what would be your priority project? Gosh, I. Uh, about half a minute left. Do you want to address the one behind you uh, while we still have a little time? Okay, this was an early sketch of the moon. Uh, that's almost nine years ago. Mm -hmm. I start out doing these when the sun, uh, and I don't have a sun sketch here I was gonna show too, they're behind, mm -hmm. I was gonna make a change of these, but uh, um, when the sun became inactive after the solar max, I uh, started sketching the moon. And uh, so I did the, the whole moon in low power, and then I did close-ups of the craters along the day-night, the Terminator line. Thanks, okay. And uh, well, similar to this one here. You've introduced us to a new world, literally, okay. Mark. So thanks so much. Oh, you're welcome, Lee. Yes, we'll hope to see you soon. All right. May your days be bright and your nights even brighter. Bye for now. Keep looking up. <laughs> okay. <laughs> see you. Okay. Well.